I'm Billy S, welcome back to the channel. You read the title, you know the topic. If you want to see part one of my Dark Souls 2 area rankings featuring areas 29th through 16th, click the card in the top right corner or the first link in the description. For those of you still here though, my top 15 Dark Souls 2 areas ranked. And be sure to leave your thoughts in the comments below. The final resting place of King Vendrick, the Undead Crypt, starts off our video as a unique little area in Dark Souls 2. You see, you're not allowed to produce any light, for if you do, you may upset Grave Warden Agdine and his compatriots, which would be very, very sad, especially if you light a specific torch and summon a whole host of red phantoms throughout the crypt to attack you, which I did not do. The actual area is fairly linear, you have a few starting rooms with enemies leading to the Grave Warden, which then opens up into a larger room filled with many, many statues. Your goal is the large hall on the far side, but to make it there you need to lower a bridge only accessible by traversing some rather cramped side rooms. I'm not the biggest fan of this area's main gimmick, which are these rooms filled with breakable rocks, tombstones, and bells. If a bell is rung, ghost enemies will begin to spawn from the tombstones, and you have to break said tombstones to stop them from respawning. The twist is that the hollow enemies throughout these rooms can also hit the bells to screw you over, so you have to manage handling them while also charting a path through the crypt and to the next rooms. There's an invasion by the nameless usurper in a rather cramped series of hallways, which would be fine if the walls weren't filled with ghosts looking to slice you up. My favourite enemies though are these shield guys who create literal barricades with their armaments. It's such a unique obstacle to deal with in a game like Dark Souls 2, and I remember not knowing how to handle them in my first playthrough. They then lead to the worst room in the area, as you drop down into another rock-filled room with tombstones. Only the hollow enemies respawn endlessly, there are tons of tombstones spawning ghosts, and there are multiple ways out of this room, but only one of them is correct. A rather frustrating experience until you memorize which path leads you back to the main crypt. From there, the last major room is the boss runback corridor leading to Velstat. It's infamous in Dark Souls 2 for being one of the more brutal boss lead-ups, given if the bell underneath the stairs you enter through is rung, there will be many ghosts on top of knights and the dragon rider chilling at the far side of the room, ready to kill you. This is made worse if you're actually killed by Velstat, as on subsequent runs, you would need to activate the fog gate. As we all know, Dark Souls 2 doesn't give you any iframes when interacting with fog gates, which makes it a frustrating final area. But as long as you found the bonfire in the first rock-filled room, it's not terrible. Undead Crypt falls into a middle ground for me, where it's not as toxic as Earthen Peak, that was funny, and its gimmicks are more fleshed out than some of the lower areas on my list, but I still wouldn't want to come here all that much. Though I will give props to the Vendrick Arena, what a haunting sight to see after defeating Velstat. It stays with you, and the graves seem to go on forever. Next up, we have the Shaded Woods. Technically, this area begins just outside of Majula with Rosabeth, a character you need to unpetrify to progress forwards. She has a fun mechanic where you can actually give her any armor you want from your inventory, and she will wear it, but she won't give it back, so be careful. It splits at the main bonfire, with two directions going to Drangleic Castle and Aldia's Keep, while the third leads to the Shaded Ruins that takes you to Brightstone Cove Seldora. That's the path I'm mainly judging, as the other two don't have much going for them. So let's step into Silent Hill instead. It's said as you traverse the fog, you may hear voices whispering shady things in your head. You cheated not only the game, but yourself. You didn't. You didn't improve. You took a shortcut and gained nothing. You experienced a hollow victory. Nothing was risked. Nothing was gained. It's sad that you don't know the difference of what true gamers are like. You have to be careful here, as invisible enemies will attack you, and you can only barely make out their silhouettes as you explore. It is actually possible to see these enemies, but you need the Eye of the Priestess from the third DLC, which is only accessible after you've done the Four Lords and or collecting enough souls to open the Shrine of Winter, so by the time you get that item, it's not really worth coming back here for. 
The ruins themselves following this area are fun to explore, but they rely on two gimmicks I don't particularly enjoy. The first being more petrified statues, a majority of which are just placed to be annoying as opposed to being placed strategically. I think it's supposed to hint that there are actual basilisks living in this area, but when you put two fragrant branch of your statues in a single corridor just to make things a little inconvenient, I question your taste level. The other main mechanic are the curse pots found throughout the ruins. They give off this creepy laughter which I really like, and should you stay in this vicinity for too long, you will become cursed and hollow, losing your humanity. It's a minor inconvenience once again, but for newer players, I can see it causing a lot of panic, especially if they don't have many human effigies. Shout out to the enemies here though, the lion warriors are right up my alley, and that's not including man scorpion Tark, who you can talk with if you've got the ring of whispers you can purchase in Majula. Do this and you can summon him for the tragic boss fight later against his partner. The last major note for the shaded woods though is that you can fall into traps if you're not careful breakable floors that will leave you surrounded by basilisks. But this is also helpful, as it'll give you access to a door containing weaponsmith horn effects. Assuming you did the most intuitive thing and unpetrified a random enemy near the bonfire to kill it for the key to the door she's locked behind, that makes sense. It's so dumb. She'll be back later, but she's your boss weapon blacksmith, so it's definitely important to free her. The Shaded Woods at least has gimmicks I can rush through, as well as some unique enemy designs. I can't say the same for a lot of Dark Souls 2, but it's the equivalent of a meh location, doesn't stick out too much. In terms of level design, I actually think Brightstone Cove Seldora is one of the best locations in the game, featuring a ton of twisty turning paths through the ruined townhouses, leading to a terrifying chapel at the bottom of a quarry. From the military camp at the start that has given me severe PTSD from farming those falconers in their glorious run cycles for sunlight medals last year, the area is off to a good start. Hello. You have to fight through peasants and workers leading up to the mid-boss in the first church, the less we say about them the better, but Brightstone Cove is at its best in the main town. You have many ways in which to get down to the lower levels of the chasm, including jumping, zip lines, or making your way through the buildings themselves, which can be like a maze. I've been through this area multiple times now, and I still don't know how everything connects. The mage enemies here can be pretty annoying, especially combined with the hollows that are being controlled by the spiders on their backs. A horrifying prospect to be sure, especially the area with the giant whirlpool of quicksand. The enemies here are just relentless in a way that feels incredibly unfair, which is annoying because of all the places in the game, that's where Weaponsmith Ornifex has set up her shop. I guess I get it, she's a bird, birds eat spiders, but what the fuck from soft. There's at least a bonfire nearby for easy access, but there's a reason I rarely bother with boss weapons in this title, and that's because of the elephant in the room. I am severely arachnophobic. I can't stand spiders. I respect they exist. I just don't want them near me, and the ones in this game are just ugh. Makes me very uncomfortable traversing the cove, especially if a spider sneaks up on me. So that's why I always carry a torch when I come here because the spiders hate the firelight. I've gotten better with age though, and I think Bloodborne's realistic spiders are worse, but it's like comparing chopping off one finger to chopping off two fingers. I'd rather just not. But I can't deny, the twisting turning level design really appeals to me. They even have you traveling across Freya's threads in the room leading up to her boss fight. And her arena is very striking given there's a giant dead dragon corpse strung up in the room. Another allegory to Seif the Scaleless, followed by you ambush and killing the hollow duke in his private study. The only room that feels remotely like a normal place in the cove. It's a fascinating area with a lot of nooks and crannies to explore, special items to find, and even the end of a quest line between two of the shiftiest people you will ever meet. So it ranks highly, even if I would rather run in the other direction and never look back. One of the earlier levels in Dark Souls 2, Huntsman's Copse is a fun area with a lot to do. You get to travel through some dark caverns filled with poison butterflies after being extorted for money by a priest, explore a dark abandoned building with a few secrets here and there, there's a winding path upwards through the forest, past a large lowerable bridge, and around a chasm until you reach a large waterfall where the bosses of this area lay. 
and even a little necromancer cave you can explore to vanquish a few skeletons and unlock a shortcut back to the locked bonfire. Unless you find the key, of course. The first half of the area is fine. The abandoned building has destructible windows and doors, which is fun, as well as a few tough roguelike enemies to keep you on your toes. But I mainly enjoy the copes for everything afterwards. Exploring the forest hills and dropping into abandoned hideaways is pretty fun. You might get invaded by good old Forlorn here, or you might get poisoned by a butterfly or two. But it's fun. Just follow the hollow running around and see what life's all about. On the main path, you all know I love the gimmick of locking off a bonfire and forcing you to overcome something to access it, in this case, finding the key to the building, which also frees one of those two NPCs I mentioned in the last entry, the shifty ones. More of this from software, thank you very much. There's just a nice level of challenge, as this area doesn't focus too much on one aspect of its level design for very long. One minute, large forest clearing with tons of space. The next, you're on a narrow chasm path. It's hard to dodge attacks. You could roll to your death if you're not careful. Most infamously though, there's the optional area leading to the Undead Purgatory, where the Executioner's Chariot boss awaits. The path leads through a cramped valley, containing some very difficult Executioner enemies that will make your life a living hell given how hard they are to stagger, followed by an evil wooden bridge with holes where you wouldn't expect, ending in a red phantom fight against a tanky boy. If this path were a bit less brutal, I might actually rank this area higher, but it feels like a real step up in difficulty compared to the rest of the areas at this point in the game, in a way that feels a little on the cheap side. Huntsman's Copse does get a big boost from both its boss arenas having extremely cool aesthetics. Either a deadly Colosseum racetrack with a mad chariot bearing down upon you, or a bone-filled scene of death and lavishness from the Skeleton Lords. Whatever the case, Huntsman's Copse makes an impression, and for me, that impression is almost always positive. Just missing out on my top 10, we have the area that survives purely on aesthetics, Hyde's Tower of Flame, because let's be real for a moment, if I was solely basing this on level design and nothing else, this area is a footnote. It's tiny, made up of four main platforms and that's it. Just a couple of large knight enemies on the main path, a few extras, a couple hide knights, and a fairly easy wyvern on the optional path. Now, in the 2014 release of Dark Souls 2, we didn't have any hide knights here, or the dragon, this area was a lot quieter. But it was also far more manageable because with such a small space, you can't handle a lot of enemies in one go. In Scholar of the First Sin, all the Hyde Knights that were left around Drang Laic were moved to Hyde's Tower of Flame, which I guess makes sense in principle, but was an incredibly cruel joke from the developers once you realize what they truly did. You see, by adding the Wyvern outside the old Dragon Slayer boss fight, you're encouraging players to instead kill the Dragon Rider boss first before tackling the Dragon Slayer, because one is easier than the other. The issue is that once you kill the Dragon Rider, every single Hyde Knight becomes permanently aggressive. Normally they'll remain passive unless attacked, aside from the few guarding the Wyvern. Now they all want to kill you. And that's a problem because in the 2014 base game, these guys were known to be incredibly difficult, and that difficulty was not lowered for this version. So you're basically getting swarmed by an incredibly challenging set of enemies at the start of the game, and forced to fight far harder odds to reach the old Dragon Slayer. Now, this encourages players to go somewhere else and level up and then come back later, which I believe is what the developers wanted, but by then, when you do get to the Dragon Slayer boss, you'll kill it in a few hits, because it's still designed to be fought in the early game because they didn't change its HP. Luckily, for Hyde's Tower of Flame, its main gimmicks aside from that still hold up. You have to kill enemies to unlock levers which can affect the arena of the Dragon Rider boss fight. Most players will do this, making the arena wider and easier to move in, while experienced players who want a speedrun will just drop the Dragon Rider to his death. It depends on your perspective. Aesthetically though, this is one of the most beautiful areas in the game, and a very rare showcase of just how good Dark Souls 2's lighting engine can look. The large knights are a solid early game challenge that can teach you how to avoid large sword swing attacks effectively, and that's coming from personal experience. These large knights taught me how to get good, and I even like the way they handled the encounter with the three knights in this area, where the first will aggro and then the other two will only approach after the first is killed. More of this, less of forced proximity aggro ranges, thank you very much. 
I admit, Hyde's Tower of Flame is this high due to bias. There's no other way around it. I just have the biggest soft spot for this area, but not enough to ignore its flaws, and how I just don't like the way it's set up in Scholar. I'll be curious to see how you all think in that regard. I always have at least one or two hot takes in these rankings, and I've got a couple coming up. The first, right now, being that I think the gutter is a well-designed area that combines a fun layout with Dark Souls 2's torch mechanic in a way that feels purposeful and intentional. I know the fanbase is averse to any type of area that remotely looks like Blight Town. I'm gonna do my best though to try and fight for the gutter because I think it deserves it. This area is a maze. You understand this from the get-go when you see there are multiple paths you can initially take. Walk forwards, cross a shaky bridge and take the path more traveled, or do some risky jumps and see what's going on down below. There are so many little dark corners and hidden buildings to explore on the road less traveled. But unlike other maze-like areas, because of Dark Souls 2's focus on the torch, you can actually light up your path via the many sconces littering the environment. Not only will lighting every torch in the gutter get you an invader to fight, but lighting any of the torches is both permanent and a way of marking where you've been. It's like a visual trail of breadcrumbs you can use to see, oh, I've been there, let's look somewhere else. Because it's not actually clear where you need to go, you're given a lot of freedom to explore at your leisure, poke around the different platforms, fight some of the hollows and creatures looking to kill you, while avoiding gravity's effects. There are hidden caves, including an ant queen. There are cliffside paths that loop back around to the bonfire if you find them. I'm partial to this little circle of torches, it just looks cool. And there's even a very well hidden area that I don't think I found since my first playthrough of Dark Souls 2 when I could remember all the secrets. Once you reach the secondary bonfire, the gutter becomes less chaotic and maze-like, instead presenting you with a single large building with a series of ladders leading down, where you have to find your way to the bottom however you can. The ladders all lead to different platforms, some are dead ends, and some don't even have anything below them. It's an interesting building, but feels like it needed a little more fleshing out, because it ends rather abruptly after you dive through some mandatory corrosive pots, which also didn't need to be there, to end up in the Black Gulch. The first two thirds of the gutter are what I find to be top tier level design. The threat of death is always there due to gravity, but the enemies aren't overwhelming. The platforms are fun to explore, and it truly encourages the player to figure things out for themselves. It's not for everyone, but I think it's better designed than Blight Town on a purely level design basis. It's on par with 5-1 from Demon Souls as well, a level I infamously quite enjoy. Perhaps I'll make a poll on my community tab to settle this little score, see which of these three levels the community prefers the most. Next up, we have the classic case of the level with brilliant design that is let down by the sheer awful nature of some of its more plentiful enemies. The Lost Bastille and Sinner's Rise, it's all one area to me, is one of the earliest locations you'll encounter that introduces you to the winding interconnectivity the Soulsborne series is known for. With two distinct entrances, depending on whether you arrived by ship or giant crow, and various shortcuts throughout that link to different parts of the complex, it does feel like a microcosm of Dark Souls 1 world design. Not as polished, don't get me wrong, but the Lost Bastille does a lot right to make this area feel different to those that came before it, especially No Man's Wharf and Hyde's Tower of Flame. Whichever way you enter, you'll end up needing to unpetrify this lovely soul to gain access to the main area, and it's here where you'll be spammed with enemies. I don't recall if it was this bad in the original 2014 release, but in Scholar, every enemy will target you and run outside to kill you the moment you open this door. It's great fun every time you have to boss run back to the ruined sentinels and kill them every single time. There are also these cool pyromancers and a hidden blacksmith I'd like to shout out but also you'll be meeting a lot of rather irritating doggos, especially if you came through No Man's Wharf, that will make your entrance a living hell. Combine that with the Lost Bastille being the hot spot for pursuer appearances, and you'll be checking your back after entering every room. The main portion of the Bastille following the Ruined Sentinels is mainly populated by these explosive prisoners on the main path. They are not fun enemies to fight, nor do they feel particularly inspired. You can hop down some side paths and fight some good enemies in a courtyard below, leading to a ton of hidden rooms with different treasures, or you can visit Belfry Luna, which I'll be including in this entry. In the 2014 release, you actually had to beat the Belfry Gargoyles in order to get the Bastille key hidden beyond. 
In Scholar, the Bastille Key has been placed just past the Servant Quarters bonfire, so no longer do you have to fight the gargoyles. I do like this little homage to the Capra Demon, especially the part where it's just as bad as the Capra Demon, lamel. Beyond the various hidden rooms and elevators, the Lost Bastille has a petrified NPC, Strayed, who you can trade boss souls with for spells, so be sure to grab him, even if he's in one of the most annoying locations due to all the explodey boys outside of his cell, why do they keep doing this? Sinner's Rise Beyond is a more straightforward section of the level. You have to cross a large open bridge where if you hesitate, you will get sniped. There's a bonfire you can grab before heading down a giant elevator and finding yourself face to face with a respawning flexile sentry and a whole host of locked cell doors. Have the Bastille key and you can use one of the upper doors to get to the bridge leading to the boss fight. Otherwise, you have to pull a lever in the water and then leg it while the explodey men chase you. Sinner's Rise feels like it's got a lot of storytelling in its environment, you can figure out what this place was used for overall, and that goes for the Bastille in general, but I think the first half of Lost Bastille was stronger as an entire area. It makes a good first impression on the player and teaches you a lot of important information you can take with you into the rest of the game, and should be everybody's first destination when it comes to collecting the Lord Souls if you're new. Just wish it didn't have those explodey boys. For that, it ranks at number 9. Another area that is really fun to me from a level design perspective, but brought down so hard by its enemies. Not necessarily for their designs, but for Scholar of the First Sin's changes to aggro range. Introducing the Iron Keep. You either love it or you hate it, it's the Marmite of Dark Souls. But I've always loved this area, and the way each room has a completely different focus to it. From the scorched, ominous bridge leading towards the main gates from which you'll meet our favourite pair of invaders, Fencer Sharon and Armourer Dennis, who both absolutely enjoy destroying my strength build with their dexterous hands. Armourer Dennis and I especially have a storied history, as you can find him much earlier in the game, but I'll get there soon. The first half of the Iron Keep is dedicated to the boss run leading to the Smelter Demon, or not if you turn off the furnace in the centre of the area and skip it entirely. You'll be missing out on a crucial bonfire for exploring the keep though, as well as a quality boss fight. When people slam the Iron Keep, this area is why they hate it. Because the Alon Knights home in on your position from fucking orbit, the archers seem to know exactly where you are from the moment you get off the Earthen Peak elevator, and these enemies run at you so fast that you often don't have time to think. The poorly designed enemy AI ruins what could otherwise be a fun room to explore, with a few ladders in the corners leading to upper platforms, a few fun risky jumps that feel great to nail, and the aforementioned furnace puzzle you can deactivate to skip the smelter demon boss. It's a shame because I have actually good memories of the 2014 variation of this place, still filled with enemies, but at least they were more manageable to crowd control, though I could be looking at it through rose tinted glasses it's been a long time. Still love this guy you can ballista from behind, though. Also love that outside of the merchant shop near the start of the castle, you can actually see the boss arena for the old Iron King. You know I love that stuff. The second half of the Iron Keep is far more enjoyable, featuring breakable platforms, those turtle enemies you may have seen once or twice in the Forest of Fallen Giants that I have a partial bias for, and a series of platforms you can lower and raise using levers to dunk your enemies into a nice hot bath. I never go to the normal route in this room, instead usually checking out Belfry's soul nearby, which is fine. I had to farm an enemy spawn there for an achievement once, which was miserable, but the actual area is a pretty simple rooftop with a good jump scare if you go to ring the bell. Back in the keep, I like to take the upper path past this invader and up to the rooftops leading to the next room. This is so I can grab the covetous gold serpent ring that's hidden on this melting pot, though little tip? You can skip this because you can actually get the plus one version of this ring by spending 10,000 souls with the merchant at the start of the Iron Keep. Either way, I find these rooms more engaging and fun than the first area. We don't talk about the lower platforms that you need to either use a spell or douse yourself in water to traverse. They're tedious and it's a mechanic Elden Ring did so much better in regards to lava damage. The last portion of the level is Eggle's Idol, a large statue with a series of traps that if you climb up, you get a bonfire, and a lever disabling all the traps in the Iron Keep. A worthwhile endeavour as it allows you to collect the Iron Key at the start of the level, which becomes relevant for helping access the second DLC of the game via the Salamander Pit in Forest of the Fallen Giants. All of this is leading to an actually iconic boss arena, if for the wrong reasons. That hole. That hole. 
Iron Keep is a fun level, it just features a lot of tedium in the first half due to its enemies, while the second half aims to fix that by not having quite so many enemies aggro on you per room. It all comes down to personal preference at the end of the day, and for me, that preference is good. The true first major area of the game that players will find the Forest of Fallen Giants is a central location to both your initial adventures in Drangleic, as well as the narrative of the game as a whole, being the area with the most focus on the lore of the giants. These creatures from across the sea, who Vendrick went to war against at the behest of his beloved Nishandra, can only be found here. As a level though, the forest is easily, outside of the DLC, the most interconnected and well-designed area of the game, in my opinion. That doesn't mean it's the best area outside of the DLC, but it certainly gives players a ton to explore, lots of little side paths, optional content to interact with, multiple bosses, and so much more. The opening portion of the level is divisive. As a fan of the original 2014 release, I liked the gradual rise in difficulty, fighting a few hollows at the river, climbing up to this large room, and seeing a hide knight resting by a tree in the center. It was intimidating, and he wouldn't bother you unless you attacked him. In Scholar, they added an ogre to the opening river, which just... Why? It doesn't add anything, it just makes the level feel less organic. And they removed the Hide Knight and just copy-pasted a fuckton of basic hollows to fight when you get close. It's a shame they changed this first portion of the level, because once you reach the Cardinal Tower bonfire, the forest truly shines. You have to navigate your way around a ton of different setups, including this outdoor area with a lot of jumping that will take you to Kale the Cartographer. Further up, you can climb this ladder on this platform and fight the Pursuer in a non-boss format. Kill him here and he doesn't appear as a boss. I love this little addition, as skilled players can take him out there and then. I was more focused on grabbing the items left around the arena since I didn't plan on fighting him, and there's an Esther shard up there, but it is what it is. There's a shortcut I always struggle to open here where you can blow this wall up, but I never did that this playthrough because I suck. I like the Ballista Ambush just before Pate, especially if you have a Pharos Lockstone, as you can unlock a room containing the Cloranthi Ring and a Titanite Slab, very useful early game items. Pate's segment is not that good though, every enemy comes out to attack you all at once, which just felt a bit heavy handed. Then you can wrap back to the elevator for the last giant, as well as a shortcut for the bonfire, and head down to the boss. Beating the boss lets you head up the battlements where you can fight the pursuer, and you get your look at this ocean overlook you'll be revisiting later in the giant memories. And that's not touching upon all the optional paths, like this scaffolding outside the main bonfire. The salamander pit you can access via this door next to the last giant using the iron key from the iron keep. And that will allow you to find the DLC item needed to access the crown of the old Iron King DLC, nice. There's even an optional area deep within the forest leading to the Soldier's Rest Bonfire, where you'll be invaded by our good friend, Armorer Dennis, as I live and breathe. I'm honestly not sure why you would come down here unless you really want the Hunter Armor set, which is cool, but not that cool. I appreciate the optional content though. Forest of the Fallen Giants feels like a spectacle to get through, and feels like a natural progression of Dark Souls 1's Undead Burg. Like, you're really exploring these ancient ruins, and anything can happen. So many different paths, treasures, and enemies to experience. I think it does its job as an opening area very well, and while it's a little difficult for new players, it's difficulty that does feel good to overcome, and doesn't fall on the negative side of that balance. Para mi. Por mi. I'm not sure if this is common consensus when it comes to Dark Souls 2 area rankings, but I'm combining Shulva Sanctum City and the Dragon Sanctum from the same DLC as one large area. If Broom Tower and Frozen Ilium Lois all count as one area, Sanctum City should be the same. One thing of note I love about Dark Souls 2 is how divisive it makes people. I did a poll on which of the three DLCs had the best gameplay, and it was fairly split. We had defenders and detractors on all fronts, and it really made me think. 
Shulva Sanctum City, for me, is the weakest of the three DLCs, and I will explain why while still singing its praises. The outside portion of the city before the Sanctum is actually top-notch, aside from a rather brutal opening amount of enemies which are clearly designed to get players to grips with the more challenging nature of encounters in these DLCs, it almost plays like a Zelda dungeon. You have switches throughout the town that raise and lower platforms, the way to progress being to collect a bow from a corpse nearby, or use your own to hit the switches and begin puzzling your way to the Sanctum. It's just not something I expected the first time I played, and it makes Shulva feel very unique compared to, honestly, everything else in From Software history. If this was a DLC that focused more on the puzzle aspect of exploration and less on combat, I think it would be one of my favourites, but for as much fun as I love the outside city and the different puzzles, bonfires, and items you can collect by shifting platforms, the Dragon Sanctum isn't my full cup of tea. On paper, I like it, because it honestly reminds me of that funhouse yeah. idea I brought up for Aldia's Keep in the last video. It's a series of tunnels, rooms, and traps that you have to get through. Use your brain. But I'm not the biggest fan of the main room with all the spikes and the various ghost enemies. You see, the Ghost Sanctum Knights can only be vanquished after destroying their coffins. This is fine for the first two in-game, as they're found in the same room as said coffins. The others, though, further in the level, are basically invulnerable until you find a fairly hidden room on a side path where all the other coffins are sitting. I don't recall if destroying the coffins is permanent, or if it's reset upon life lost, but I just don't like the mad dash you have to make to these ones if you want any chance of exploring this temple area without getting destroyed by the ghosts. Jester Thomas, our good friend who can help you murder Mitha in the main game as here is an invasion. Truly a tragic end to our tale. Then you go outside into the lake with these monstrous beasts that feels... admittedly a bit tacked on? It feels like there was supposed to be more down here and they just filled the time with these big boys to pad the runtime a bit. As once you activate the next elevator and wrap back to the original bonfire, it's just back into the Dragon Sanctum again. I don't know why we had to leave, and then down to Alana. This last segment is fun, as you have a clear path to follow with nice side objectives and rooms, a hidden bonfire to find, and a few armored enemies that actually killed me once. It's fun, but it's obvious the Dragon Sanctum just doesn't have the quality of the Sunken City, and I just wanted more puzzle focus which is why this is my least favourite DLC, and why it just misses my top 5, because it misses its potential. Great boss arenas though, especially Sins opening up into this vast cavern expanse. Dragons and caverns go together like salt and pepper in the Soulsborne series. If we're talking atmosphere, nothing comes close to walking through a tunnel in the shaded woods and emerging into a stormy, rain-swept night, dealing with a few tough enemies and then stepping up to the bridge leading to Dranglaic Castle. This is the location you can see in the background from across the game, towering over the nation and teasing you with your eventual visit, and after killing four lords and or amassing a million souls, the time has come. Dranglayet Castle is a mostly linear experience, with pockets of optional content towards the start and finish. Entering the castle, we're introduced to an entirely new mechanic, being soul-activated statues. Kill an enemy near the statue, and their souls will activate it, opening the front door. Though you also have to get past some tough elephant soldiers first. Once inside, there's an NPC who is vital towards 100% completion as on New Game Plus Plus, he sells achievement-related content, and is a nice lore drop for those interested in the story of Dranglayet Castle. All of these little mechanics come together throughout the castle to provide nice, fun challenges, and there's even a little puzzle towards the end of the level where you need to lead a mannequin enemy into this room, kill it so that it activates the soul statue, which will then activate the elevator outside before the looking glass night. Beyond that, the main optional content stems from this room outside your main bonfire. Tons of openable doors, but once they open, they stay open and each door has a ruined sentinel hidden behind it aside from the progression door, which makes further runs through this room quite the hassle. Though one of the other doors does allow access to a secret bonfire and a Dark Diver Grandol location, so it is worth it. 
The path from here to the Twin Dragon Riders, though, is extremely linear. It's impossible to get lost, and serves as more of an enemy gauntlet with a few fancy rooms here and there. This trapped room is a favourite of mine, there's a secret bonfire as well, hidden behind an illusory wall just before Nishandra, which is a godsend, because despite Drangleic Castle's linearity, it's nice to have a contingency bonfire prior to the Dragon Riders boss fight. You never know if this might be the time they actually kill you, you know? The latter half of Drangleic Castle admittedly feels way less inspired, as a majority of the enemies used are all from earlier in the game. It doesn't feel like Drangleic Castle has its own identity when it comes to its enemy design. The knights from Hyde's Tower of Flame, pyromancers from Harvest Valley, the aforementioned Ruined Sentinels, even the Executioner's Chariot mini-boss. Aside from the unique looking enemies leading up to the Looking Glass Knight, it is just reused enemy assets. I wish we could have got something more meaty, instead those resources went into the weirdest fucking door ever. This is Silent Hill shit right here, and I love it. Luckily boss arenas can play a factor because the Looking Glass Knight arena is one of the best in the game. Such amazing ambiance as you fight your way through one of the best areas in the game to one of the worst. We love a game that goes both ways. Just missing out on the podium, it's the combination of the Dragon Airy and Dragon Shrine, the last true endgame area before you hit the memories and the DLC. There's just something amazing about emerging into the Airy and seeing all these wyverns flying about. The gorgeous orange and yellow tones of the area set the scene. It's like you've wandered into an entirely new land. Exploration is quite fun, you can choose to use a zip line and head straight to the Dragon Shrine, but the area has tons of crystal lizards to find, a few dragon mothers that you can fight if you feel like it, though I decided not to, and much more. While we do have to deal with those annoying explosive asses who happen to explode corrosive gases this time around, they're not as plentiful as in the Lost Bastille. There's just something fun about sneaking around these ancient dragons to collect whatever is to be found here. And as long as you don't crack their eggs, you will be golden, because the game goes a little bit cinematic later, as if you break their eggs, the dragons will remember that. As you cross the large bridge to the dragon shrine, if you've pissed the dragons off enough, they will come to the bridge and either scare you or straight up destroy the bridge, killing you. It's funny as fuck, but I was a good boy and they let me pass. The Dragon Shrine itself can go one of two ways. Either you run in and just start killing everything, in which case you are going to have a rough experience, or you can do what the game suggests and duel the large knights, as if you beat them, the smaller dragon soldiers will let you pass and explore. That's what I did this playthrough, and it made exploring very relaxing, as these guys didn't want to harm me. I'd proven myself strong enough to take down some of their best warriors, so they didn't even mind me going off the beaten path to find a giant egg in one of the towers, which can be used at the Merchant in the Iron Keep for a new covenant. Of course, we all remember our first experience dealing with a dual-wielding Dragon Knight just before the Ancient Dragon Chamber, easily the toughest fight in the area by far, and a very climactic and fun battle on the stairs before heading up to say hola, buenas to the Ancient Dragon. What can I say? The area may not be massive, but you can feel the lore and the history of the Dragon Airy and Shrine in a way that not many areas in this game can convey. The only downside is if you die to the Ancient Dragon after instigating the fight with it, everything will want to kill you, so getting back is going to be painful. Be sure to one-shot that dragon. You will thank me later. It's easily the best explorable base game level, but not the best area in the base game. I went back and forth over which DLC I preferred of the two remaining, and there are genuine arguments for both of them, as well as Shulva, but ultimately my bronze trophy goes to Frozen Helium Lois. This DLC's main feature is the way you can explore it twice over under different circumstances. When you first arrive, everything is frozen. The set pieces you approach the main gate is ominous and epic. If you turn left after entering, you can try fighting Arva while she's invisible. I wouldn't recommend it. I didn't bother. But you can. The first run through Ilium Lois is very much a scouting mission. Noting where certain enemies are, which ones aren't aggroed yet, optional paths you can't access, things like that. 
It's oppressive in its atmosphere, but I do feel this DLC lacks a bit of visual flair and identity due to the frozen nature of the city. It's a whole lot of white, a lot of buildings drenched in snow, and it's not the most exciting thing to walk through. But once you get the Eye of the Priestess, defeat Ava, and talk with Alsana, things get really fun. The storm dissipates, and you now have full reign to explore to your heart's content. Or you can just go do the final boss now. The idea of the exploration rewarding you with the Lois Knights, who are basically required to give you a fighting chance in the Burnt Ivory King fight, is tantalizing, and also provides for something to work towards. Once you reach a knight, you know you've hit a dead end and can explore elsewhere. Maybe you'll find a cave with two flexile sentries and a key leading to the worst area in the game. Or maybe you'll deal with a pit of icy Sonic the Hedgehogs before opening a gate and entering a cavern where a frozen Jabba the Hutt awaits. Maybe you'll visit a room where, when frozen, you could clearly see a mimic, but when unfrozen, that mimic thinks it's sly and is hiding again. It's the little things that add up to give this DLC a lot of charm, and the enemies, while not the most exciting to fight, do feel like the toughest in the game. I especially love the invaders that show up, there's one that tries to be your friend, and there's one that pretends to be an item and camouflage just backstabs you when you go to explore, it's great. I was on the back foot despite being severely overleveled for a majority of this DLC, and that's honestly how I like it. It's impressive how interconnected they made Elium Lois, it feels like a true city. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention the old Chaos Arena, which is one of the most epic set pieces Soulsborne has ever come up with. Honestly, somehow that should have been the arena for the end of the base game, and it puts the Throne of Want to complete shame. In fact, most boss arenas put the Throne of Want to complete shame. I was so tempted to put Majula as my number one area in Dark Souls 2, but I don't think I could ever actually justify putting a hub above a genuine level for the gold. So instead, Majula, take my silver medal, because what an absolutely fantastic hub you are. From the moment you emerge from things betwixt and are hit by this warm golden light, you see a small seaside town. It's derelict and forgotten, but a few people are making use of what's left, and as more people return to the town throughout the game, it begins to almost feel like home. I have a strong attachment to the NPCs of Majula, as this was my first Souls game, whether it's the crestfallen man by the monument tracking worldwide deaths, or the blacksmith who just hates us, honestly. The merchant in the house who gets a bit pushy as you buy more of his wares, or the will will cat who's so surprisingly useful wings like the cat wing, so cute baby. But nobody beats. Bear, seek, lest. The Emerald Herald is such an enigmatic character, and it's a shame that so much of her backstory was cut content, as Dark Souls 2 really shifted gears mid development in a way it couldn't quite come back from. She tells us to seek larger souls, and stays behind to empower us whenever we return. But beyond the characters, beyond the usefulness of the facilities, Majula is just… serene. It's a rare pocket of peace in a rather dangerous and confusing world, as long as you don't fuck with the pigs. There's nothing more satisfying than sitting by the cliffside and watching the ocean waves lap upon the shore, while the best hub music FromSoft has developed plays in the background. Firelink Shrine's theme is great and iconic, but Majula's theme is hauntingly beautiful. It reminds me of a time in my life that I really miss, when you could just play games while studying for school and talking with friends about it. Why else do you think I started making videos back in 2013, even though they were god-awful? And then I discovered Soulsborne a year later, and everything changed. Booting up Dark Souls 2, getting to grips with controls on keyboard that I was not comfortable with but pushed through out of young interest, only to be met with Majula? <laughs> just wow. Wow. But my favourite area of Dark Souls 2, the one I enjoy exploring the most, is Broom Tower. Am I biased because I really love the lore of the old Iron King and anything to do with his kingdom? Maybe. From the moment you walk across the chain to the main tower, you know you're in for a good time. Come on, that's so cool. 
This tower descends into the depths of the scorched land, and the goal is to use the smelter wedges found throughout the tower to destroy the ashen idols of Nadalia, claiming her soul in the process. In my boss ranking video, I made a rant that did not age well. I explained how people complaining that they ran out of smelter wedges before the Fume Knight boss shouldn't be running out of wedges because there are four more you can find up in the tower. What I didn't realize was that you could reach the Smelter Throne Suralon Bonfire before doing the Fume Knight. I thought it was the other way around, that's my mistake. But I would still leave that area for after anyway, because you can't access Suralon until after beating the Fume Knight boss. So the one idol of Nadalia on that path, just leave it alone, you'll be fine. But I digress. I loved ascending the inside and outside of the tower, balancing on machinations and running across ash-strewn landings that, from a glance, look almost like snow. The enemy designs here are fantastic, all completely original and fitting the area perfectly. I especially love the giant knights with the molten lava bleeding out of their suits, though on the flip side there are those fat crawly guys before the hot iron scepter that can just go the other way. But when only one enemy is truly meh out of the entire DLC, that's a really good sign. This tower is like a maze, with so many optional chambers to explore, many containing either important items or ashen idols to banish. It feels fun to work through, and it's rare that a room feels too difficult to conquer, this specific room notwithstanding, all the homies hate this room. I like the segments where you're breaking through the floor, trying to piece your way down and check are there enemies below? I said this about Shulva, and I'm saying this again. It feels like a 2D Zelda dungeon, and maybe that's why I like Broom Tower so much. Actually thinking about it, this is the one that's most structured like a Zelda dungeon. Oh my god. Oh my god, I'm having a moment right now. Holy shit, that's why I like it so much. With the other two DLCs and most of the areas in Dark Souls 2, I can vaguely recollect what the layout is, what the cool rooms are, etc. With Broom Tower, all the main locations you hit up, I remember. All the cool enemy setups, I remember. The awful boss run to Sir Alon, I sadly remember. All culminating in some of the coolest boss arenas in the game. Sir Alon's reflective floor, iconic. The dark blue reflecting onto the ash of the Fume Knights arena, iconic. And if there's an Ashen Idol left when you get down there, I'm sorry, you did something wrong, I'm shaking my head. Broom Tower just feels like it belongs in a more respected game, and I would love to see another crack at this vertical dungeon in a future game. Brilliant stuff for my favorite area in Dark Souls 2. Thanks for watching guys, this script was not easy to write. As it turns out, I kinda wanna get away from Dark Souls 2 for a bit, but we'll see. I still have to rank those bonfires at some point, I don't know. My social links are on screen now, feel free to follow me where you feel so inclined or comfortable. I would recommend my Twitter, as it's my only real active social media. A shout out to all of my patrons over on Patreon, you guys supporting this channel each month is amazing, and I am so incredibly grateful. I'll see you guys next week, adios.